Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone here who has joined us for this uh, very special nanomaterials webinar. Um, my name is Gerald Pasqual, and I work with operations here at Park Systems. We're an atomic force microscopy company uh, with an office here in Santa Clara, California in the U.S., and uh, we are joined today by Professor Rigoberto at Vincula from Case Western Reserve University, who is kind enough to uh, give us a presentation on high performance polymers that I'm sure every one of you uh, are very excited to hear uh, in just a few short moments. Uh, before I turn things over to Professor at Vincula, I'd like to uh, indicate a couple of rules for today's session. If uh, this is the first time you've joined us, uh, please note that this uh, session is going to be uh, a talk first, followed by a Q&A portion at the end of the professor's talk. So by design, everybody's clients, when they've logged into the session, you'll notice that your microphone or your telephone, however you're receiving this audio, is muted by default. Uh, and that's on purpose. Um, if you have any questions, though, please feel free to use the chat module or the questions module in your control panel to type in a message as it arises throughout the session. What we'll do is we'll answer them in sequence. Um, we'll direct them to the professor uh, in sequence at the end of the session and we'll go over the questions at that time. Uh, and of course, we'll also be sharing uh, our email addresses in case you have any questions about either Park Systems and our atomic force microscopy or any of the research that Professor Advincula does with high performance polymers and in other fields as well. Uh, so without further ado, I will go ahead and turn things over to Professor Advincula and we can get things uh, started here uh, shortly. Once again, thank you very much. Okay. Uh... And now it's all yours, Professor. Okay, thank you, uh, Gerald. And uh, I hope uh, you have the uh, first slide, introduction slide on the screen in front of you. Yes, we uh, do see the title slide. Good, very good. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, we have attendees actually uh, all over the world. Uh, and uh, so the, the time matters, and I know some people, in fact, uh, even watch it around midnight with their midnight snack. So, okay, so today we're going to talk about high performance polymers and nanocomposite materials. Uh, I'd like to focus the uh, uh, applications a bit on the oil and gas industry, although I will welcome any questions you have with regards to other segments uh, of the uh, uh, applications and performance in other industries. But first, let me introduce to you Case Western Reserve University. We are located in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, home of uh, the um, uh, Cleveland Orchestra, Cleveland Museum of Art, a very nice part of uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, called the University of Circle, as well as the Cleveland Clinic. So if you're in town, let me know. Uh, also, uh, we've been around for a while. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our famous alumni in the industry, of course, is Henry Dow, from uh, founder of Dow Chemicals, and uh, notable Nobel Prize winners. In fact, the first American Nobel Prize winner, Albert Michelson, uh, in physics, is just uh, a building away from our building. Uh, we are located at the uh, Kentel Smith Building, uh, the fifth floor, uh, and uh, this department, Department of Macromolecular Science Engineering, is about 52 years old. So we've been around for a while. Uh, in fact, this uh, year we inaugurated Thinkbox, a center for additive manufacturing, ideation, and innovation. Uh, we use these facilities to do 3D printing, as well as uh, availability of tools like laser cutting, um, electronics workshop, and so on. So this is actually open to the public uh, with uh, endorsement and collaboration. Now, uh, last year I started PetroCase, which is Polymers for Energy and Transformative Research in Oil and Gas. We work with a number of companies and collaborations as well in the areas of uh, polymer materials for unconventional oil and gas, uh, increasing the level of productivity and low cost of production by utilizing high-performance materials, coatings, and cost-effective fluids, 
and at the same time we're uh, cognizant and uh, I work on bio-based additives as well as uh, lower energy costs uh, or sustainability uh, engineering. Uh, we are a research group. My uh, uh, research group uh, has its academic phase. Uh, we do a lot of work at interfaces, designing new molecules, materials, and innovative surface, surface characterization methods, including AFM. Uh, we work on nanomaterials uh, where uh, structure, function, and property relationship enable us to design new uh, um, applications as well as discover paradigm. On the other hand, uh, we do interface a lot with industry. And other than our work in oil and gas, we, we do interface uh, with a number of chemical companies, polymer companies involving uh, coatings, barrier materials, packaging solutions, different types of uh, film deposition methods, and so on. So uh, as a professor, sometimes we uh, uh, look at things in the order of a establishing platform. So what we do is basically establish basic research platforms and then look at the translational research together with our industry colleagues to meet market demand. So it's all about who the customer is or maybe even what uh, 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 somebody is willing to pay for or even increasing efficiency and performance cost ratio. Uh, in fact, the paradigm between uh, what we call the pastures uh, uh, dogma is that uh, research from universities can have a basic uh, direction, but eventually it can have a societal benefit. So that's one of the philosophies I have when it comes to doing our research and working with our collaborations with industry. Uh, just to give you a picture of our lab, and uh, I hope you'll be patient. <laughs> we'll be showing. Uh, a little more about this introduction, uh, but we'll have lots of contents on high-performance polymers. Uh, we are a lab that does a lot of work on synthesis, uh, microscopy, spectroscopy, uh, different uh, probe techniques. Uh, uh, within our building, we have access to a lot of techniques for rheology, processing, uh, stress testing. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, AMMRC, SDLE, and more centers enable us to do a lot of stress testing for high-performance polymers, including environmental testing. Uh, we don't want to do things with regards to toxic chemicals, H2S, for example, simply because uh, of safety concerns within the university. But we have a lot of access to microscopy, spectroscopy, uh, and thermomechanical uh, testing. Uh, specifically for the oil and gas industry, uh, we we do work on core flooding, different types of uh, uh, fluid loss, filter take measurements, uh, viscosity control under high pressure, temperature, high throughput uh, sampling testing, as well as uh, flow loop measurements, and of course environmental testing. Okay, so let's start with polymer structures. Uh, polymer composition. Uh, of course, you can make polymers by step growth or addition polymerization. But I'd like to start by showing that polymer structures are important because, as you can see here, these are large molecules, hence the term macromolecules, that can be linear, cross-linked, branch, dendritic. Uh, and, and so this structure property relationship is quite important in defining the uh, properties and eventual applications. And of course, other than uh, structure, we need to look at the composition, blending, and eventually the processing. Very important. Processing uh, determines some of the uh, requirements for enabling a polymer to be truly a high performance uh, application. Now, we all uh, think of plastics as. Uh, uh, plastics of everyday things, from packaging paint to textile. Uh, of course, uh, this view uh, is common in society in that plastics or polymers do not work under extreme conditions. Uh, actually, uh, industries are interested also in plastics, polymers, uh, rubber as replacement for metallic parts, uh, and also for lightweighting. Lightweighting uh, simply means that they have the durability, the thermomechanical properties, 
as well as saving weight or space. Uh, and uh, this has to do with, for example, in the automotive industry, looking at carbon reinforced uh, polymers as well as uh, high temperature, uh, stable thermoplastics and thermosets. So let's have a short history of high performance uh, polymers. Uh, in the 1960s uh, or even earlier, there's, have been a, there's been a demand for polymers that can work under high temperatures or have good wear and tear properties. And of course, one can guess that a lot of that requirements would fall under the U.S. military or even uh, NASA requirements. Uh, but eventually, what enabled us to uh, utilize high-performance polymers is their availability commercially. So one, uh, uh, some of you may, of course, be familiar with trade names like Captain, Kevlar, Ultem, Furlon, or uh, now we, uh, we simply designate terms like PIC, PIEC, PA, PBI. Uh, this pyramid uh, uh, is one of the ways we can classify their performance with regards to temperature and their processability. Uh, basically, uh, we can of course divide uh, uh, polymers into what we call thermoplastics, meaning you can still change their shape with heating or uh, define heat reflection temperature. Uh, on the other hand, a thermoset means that the polymer either has a very high melting point or no melting point at all, or is very highly cross-linked. Now, the uh, abbreviations are shown here, if you want to be familiar with them. Uh, uh, when we say PEI, it's polyether emid, PI, polyemid, uh, polycarbonate, PPS, uh, a polytenyl sulfone, or polytenyl sulfide. Uh, uh, the structures are shown on the right are some of the common polymers like called Kevlar, Kapton, PBT, uh, uh, Upilex, and so on. So the history means that uh, commercially available materials, uh, accessibility, cost-effective uh, performance uh, ratio enable us to use them for practical application. Now this shows another hierarchy of the polymer uh, commercial space in that uh, commodity polymers like PS, HDPE, polypropylene, uh, these are the most abundant polymers, synthetic polymers made. Uh, they can be classified as amorphous, semi-crystallines, or elastomeric in nature. Uh, as you can guess, they are uh, low priced and are, are pretty good in a number of uh, everyday applications, including industrial applications. But once one uses these polymers for uh, chemical resistivity, inertness, high uh, temperature or abrasion, or even metallic re replacement parts. You really have to go to what we call high-performance polymers. And this includes uh, not only uh, uh, aromatic uh, structured polymers, but also ones that contain uh, carbon fluorine bonds. And uh, in fact, most of the Fluoroelastomerics or fluoropolymers are considered to be uh, high performance and more expensive because they're the only ones that can do the job uh, in most uh, the most demanding applications. For example, um, uh, F e -F -P -E, F -F -M, F -M are for fluoroelastomers, uh, fluoroelastomers. On the other hand, uh, general engineering polymers like polyacrylamide or or um, different types of uh, um, aramines are, are, are very good uh, and of the right price uh, cost performance ratio. Now uh, one can see that the chemical structures of these polymers usually uh, involve that of many aromatic groups, cross-linked structures uh, sometimes, uh, carbon fluorine and carbon double carbon bond, less nitrogen nitrogen bonds, uh, meaning very stable, high uh, enthalpic uh, bond energy, uh, and, and, and even the use of uh, inorganic fillers to improve their uh, thermodynamic properties. So by definition, 
uh, we can classify high performance polymers to have these particular properties. They are very durable, that le at least at, uh, above uh, 177 degrees C, very little change in composition, structure, or shape. Now, most polymers that you see around you, uh, or the commodity polymers, typically uh, are um, degraded totally at around 350 to 400 degrees C. That means their melting point uh, can appear early at uh, you know, 150 to 200, uh, low thermal, uh, thermal or glass transition temperatures, softening temperature. Uh, so really, we're looking at durability uh, over high temperatures. Uh, high decomposition temperature, for example, means uh, there's only about 5 weight percent loss at 450 degrees C. That means uh, these polymers have high melting points as well as high ceiling temperatures. Uh, low weight loss rates, uh, high heat deflection temperature. Uh, this is the temperature by which applying a load or mechanical load will result in deformation. And again, these polymers are, have high aromatic content and relatively rigid surface. Now, aromatic content, content, of course, means you have a lot of double bonds, resonance stabilized. Therefore, they're not easy to um, break. Um, here, in the uh, high deflection temperature of some uh, uh, high-performance polymers uh, shows that uh, typically uh, these polymers have uh, 200 degrees C in terms of deflection. In fact, liquid crystalline polymers have a wide range, and we'll talk a little more about liquid crystalline polymers later. It can go up to as 300, between 180 to 300 degrees. The other thing that, uh, um, of course, influences uh, heat deflection temperature is the presence of inter non-covalent forces of interaction, very strong ones, including hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, and so on. So one can relate to the structure of a polymer, look at the presence of aromatic groups, CF bonds, as well as um, uh, hydrogen bonding, for example, as components that will enable one to prepare uh, truly interesting high-performance properties. So here is just a summary uh, of what might be encountered in a polymer structure that ha have high performance. Uh, easily from the table, one can see that the double bonds, the carbon fluorine bonds, have very high, have high dissociation energy as compared to a simple carbon-carbon bond of an aliphatic chain. Okay. Now, uh, we'll go, be going in and out with the challenges and opportunities in the oil and gas industry. There's a lot of interest in what we call non-metallics. There's a lot of interest in high-performance polymers that can be used under harsh operating conditions, high pressure, high temperature, high brine condition. Uh, this really is a uh, proposition between the supply chain, the manufacturer, and the operator or oil field service company in that the development of uh, new high-performance polymers will need cooperation, will need uh, joint industry ventures as well because knowing the requirements and the uh, uh, um, relationship between their performance and the ability to manufacture them and then lastly the ability to synthesize new polymers is very important. So that type of communication and uh, JIVs or joint industry ventures is important. So, for example, this uh, chart shows us uh, shows us what might be encountered uh, downhole with uh, beef uh, reservoir um, conditions, 10, 20,000 feet, experiencing 10 to 20,000 psi, uh, temperature range 150 to 200 degrees C. Are classified as HPHD conditions, uh, and as you go beyond, you get ultra-high pressure, high temperature, and even uh, HPHDSC. Uh, one can imagine if you're going to uh, geothermal wells or even magnetic type of drilling, uh, a lot of these things will not last at all. And uh, this uh, uh, chart as well shows how some um, 
polymers, uh, uh, elastomeric systems, really have their limits at around 200 degrees C. Now, other than uh, high pressure, high temperature, one can, of course, experience different types of fluids, gases, uh, rapid gas decompression at those uh, um, pressures, uh, souring uh, uh, or fouling with H2S and CO2, chemical attack, and so on. So, so all of these things can combine to produce failure. And therefore, understanding failure, forensics, is one important to learn, but also being proactive in uh, preparing for those failure mechanisms. So, for example, many companies, including the operators, seal manufacturers, fiber manufacturers, uh, completion tool, uh, fabrication of all field service companies, are all interested in high performance polymers for pipe linings, for uh, completion uh, tools, parts, drilling, uh, parts, trackers, hoses, risers, uh, different types of sealants, uh, and so on. Now, what is the market for high temperature polymers? Now, uh, this is not classified essentially for oil and gas, but for all polymers, high performance polymers. In general, there's a high demand for fluoropolymer simply because in many situations, uh, they're, they're cost effective and they're also the ones that can only do the job. On the other hand, you can see here uh, different market shares for polyimide, polyphenol sulfide, uh, PEI. This is actually an older chart and this would have uh, changed um, already, but this just gives you a sampling of what are some of the common high performance polymers and their market demand. Uh, it is a combination of price, uh, cost versus tensile strength. Uh, one can see a differentiation between thermosets and thermoplastics. Uh, thermoplastics are extrudable at high temperatures. Thermosets are extrude, uh, extruded but reacted in order to form a mold. And once you form that mold or shape, you cannot uh, uh, change it. So, for example, thermoset resins uh, like epoxy, cyanates, polyimides, phenolic, uh, cured polyesters means that you can process them as maybe as precursors, but eventually cured by thermal curing or uh, reactive uh, um, processes for cross-linking. So what you can see here that peak is an overall blue polymer when one requires uh, high tensile strength uh, uh, and other structural resins. On the other hand, because of course it's more expensive than your useful polyether image or PPS. Uh, epoxy is an overall good uh, cross-linking system, but this can be rivaled, let's say, by polyurethane systems and perhaps even with polybenzoxazine type of materials. So this one gives you the uh, comparison of what might be required in terms of their cost and thermal strength. Now let me introduce at this point what 3D printing is and what it may or may not do. Of course, there's a lot of interest on parts on demand applications, uh, different types of complexity in design. Uh, I, I can tell you that a lot of 3D printing materials are essentially thermoplastics and they fail. They have many failure modes uh, and it's not easy to 3D print uh, high performance uh, polymer materials. But the value chain is in 3D printing, one can command a premium uh, because of the on-demand type of manufacturing. And therefore, the right value chain of 3D printing is if you have the right performance, right complexity, and right cost. It's, the, uh, it's very competitive compared to traditional high-throughput uh, manufacturing, uh, including extrusion, molding, and thermoforming. So in fact, the, there are many possibilities uh, in industry uh, that uses 3D printing, which can be replacement for metallic parts or ceramic parts. But essentially, 3D printing caters to all those type of materials. And there is uh, demand, uh, in fact, for high-performance polymer materials for 3D printing. Uh, I'd be happy to give a uh, more description of our work on 3D printing of high-performance polymers such as PPS, 
PBI uh, peak uh, on another occasion. So uh, let's look at some general classes of polymer materials. You have uh, the polyether imides, polyimides. Okay, uh, polyether imides uh, uh, was uh, actually first um, commercialized by a number of companies, including GE Plastics. Now uh, Sabic, uh, Dupont has uh, also their own trade name. Uh, polyether imide means that you have a uh, ether linkage and the imide is formed from the corresponding precursor. Okay, and Captain, for example, and Ultem are trade names. Uh, so, for example, polyether imides can be synthesized in this manner, uh, starting with the corresponding uh, talic anhydride, you form your uh, bisphenol A dianhydride reacting with a phenylene diamine and subsequent heating closes the ring to form a polyimide. So typically polyimides are synthesized as processable precursors and then uh, uh, cured, totally cured by heating uh, resulting in a thermoset with a lot of aromatic structure. So when we say a thermoset, it doesn't mean that uh, it, it's, it's cross-linked but rather the the um, melting point is so high that you first you end up degrading the polymer before melting. Okay, uh, polyethylene has some of these properties as you can see. It can be reinforced with glass or other fillers, resulting in more uh, thermoset-like uh, behavior. Uh, you have the uh, uh, um, critical strain versus uh, Phasing or cracking. Uh, here you can see that uh, uh, PEI, for example, are, uh, are swelled by solvents uh, that are specific for its uh, aromaticity and polarity. On the other hand, uh, other solvents uh, will not swell it. So they have a good um, um, shape, a thermomechanical as well as lyotropic uh, stability. Now in the oil and gas industry, again, several requirements uh, in terms of their durability means that you can uh, use them for different types of equipment, replacement parts. They have high chemical resistance. Uh, they can uh, survive a wide range of temperature, uh, non-abrasive uh, uh, properties as well. And so overall, PEI polyimides is a good uh, um, non-metallic material for the oil and gas industry as well as many other industries. Um, the other polymer of interest here, we're looking at polyether ether ketone or polyether ketones, uh, uh, different types of aromatic variants. As shown here, uh, PIC uh, is basically a uh, ether with a ketone um, 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 structure, no hydrogen bonding, but this means that you have good thermoplastic processing at a high temperature, but once you process it, it has good uh, shape and thermodynamic stability. Excellent strength, stiffness, lightweight, okay, uh, that means no corrosion, okay, low coefficient of friction, high wear resistance, and so on. So pink is an overall good uh, performance material for a number of applications. Now polysulfones, polyether sulfones, um, they have good heat deflection temperature, low water absorption, a good tensile strength, flexure modulus. They are competitive in some ways to peak but not uh, uh, as uh, good as peak in a number of applications requiring good abrasion resistance or temperature stability. Nevertheless, uh, polysulfones and polyethersulfone finds its uh, way in many uh, parts, uh, coatings, uh, and uh, um, molded structures. Uh, polyphenylene sulfide, as shown here, basically prepared in a type of etherification or thioetherification reaction. It uh, a good uh, commercial uh, trade name is Riton. 
which was uh, with Chevron Philips for a while until it was acquired by Solvay. Uh, it uh, is, is processable at a high temperature, okay, uh, and uh, similar to uh, polyvinyl steel foams, uh, they're very durable and good replacement parts as well, and they're uh, cost competitive. Now, uh, there are other uh, polymers that we can obviously look at, but right now I'd like to turn our attention to liquid crystalline polymers. So what are liquid crystalline polymers and are they available? Uh, yes, they are commercially available, very expensive. Uh, first of all, liquid crystalline polymers display what we call thermotropic and lyotropic properties. Common one is based on their rigid rod structure, meaning they can have anisotropic order uh, and can only be uh, uh, transitioned to the isotropic phase at a higher temperature or even a uh, uh, nasty solvent such as sulfuric acid. Okay? So because of this, liquid crystalline polymers have excellent uh, properties, uh, modulus, elongation, pleasure of modulus, strength, very high deflection temperature as you can see here. And uh, a uh, specific gravity, um, typical high-performance polymers. Uh, uh, so this, this type of polymers are considered uh, the highest class of what you can get with uh, a, a polymers that are difficult to process, but once you uh, mold them, once you uh, prepare them uh, as different shapes, they, they have high temperature uh, uh, and also abrasion resistance. Now, uh, a good type of polymer, uh, uh, more on the going towards the uh, resins and crossing systems, but at the same time, polyurethanes can also be thermoplastic processable materials. In general, polyurethane is a good combination of cost, wide range of processability, uh, and can be used for a variety of applications including coatings, liners, uh, different types of reinforced uh, uh, parts, fiber reinforced parts, uh, and can have some applications in uh, um, drilling parts, assemblies, and so on. Okay, so polyurethane is one polymer to remember for uh, those applications. They're not quite high performance, but overall, uh, many durable applications, not only in the oil field, but in many industries as well, including. Uh, insulation, um, automotive, and so on. Now, epoxy is a workforce, a lot of coatings, a lot of uh, thermoset parts, uh, have uh, epoxy based compositions or reinforced epoxy based composition or fused banded epoxy uh, in pipes, uh, for example. Uh, so, the only caveat with epoxy is sometimes. Uh, because of their two-part nature uh, and curing time, uh, they're a disadvantage in uh, uh, processing. Uh, even polyurethanes can have that problem. Uh, however, epoxies can be combined with amine, urethane functionality, uh, and of course filler materials to improve their properties as well as uh, durability. Acrylics are used but not uh, at high temperature or demanding applications. Acrylics are basically used uh, for architectural or uh, low temperature uh, applications. They are not as resistant to um, um, abrasion or chemical attack, but as you can see, uh, acrylics uh, have a good uh, structural finish and are relatively inexpensive. So again, here's a table that summarizes some of the polymers uh, used uh, in the upstream and offshore, comparing that of epoxy, polymers, polyurethane, uh, different types of fluorinated structures, not only polytetrafluoroethylene, but polyvinylidene fluoride or PVDF, uh, goes by different trade names, including Kynar, uh, many uses. For midstream and transport, uh, phenol formaldehyde uh, is a good uh, um, 
comparison to epoxy, uh, phenol formaldehyde has been around for a long time actually. Uh, it goes back to the chemistry of Bakelite. And it's an overall uh, good material, but the caveat with phenol formaldehyde is they are, uh, can be quite brittle. Okay? And uh, may not have the chemical uh, inertness of, let's say, uh, epoxies. So in this case, polyurethane, you can see uh, in many, many applications, simply because they're easier to process uh, in many ways compared to phenol formaldehydes and epoxies. And here's uh, more comparison of what uh, might be used. Now, polyethylene and polypropylene are being used uh, for pipes, for coatings, for top coatings. Uh, of course, they are not soluble, but rather melt, process, extruded, or as prepared as in, in, uh, heat shrink wraps or different types of extruded uh, blown films. Now, let's turn our attention to uh, polymer nanocomposites. Polymer nanocomposite means that we have nanofillers, nanomaterials, nanoparticles that can be used. Uh, and incorporated as blends or processed as chemical additives. So uh, uh, as you can see in this list, uh, commercially available uh, as well would be uh, nanoclays, silica, uh, different types of uh, carbon nanotubes, graphenes, cellulosic nanofibers, and even plasmonic materials such as gold or silver nanoparticles. Now, uh, nanomaterials can be incorporated and compatibilized uh, until you reach what, what we call the minimum percolation threshold. The minimum percolation threshold is the minimum amount of material to observe a desired property. And that doesn't have to be the amount of material that is uh, homogeneously distributed necessarily, but it could be the amount of material that is needed to form a good network structure or a good layered or tortuous fat structure. Uh, so here are, for example, uh, some of the uh, uh, SCM and PM images of graphene oxide incorporated in polymers or clay or carbon nanotubes or even silica nanoparticles of a high concentration on a polymer material. Uh, POS are polyhedral oligomeric silsestioxanes. These are monodispersed uh, siloxane nanoparticles, uh, which have very interesting properties for dispersions as well as uh, different composites. So talk about carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes have come in the form of multi-wall, single-wall nanotubes. Single-wall nanotubes are typically more conducting uh, yes, they are commercially available. They used to be very hard to obtain, but they are commercially available. Uh, that means you have uh, ability to uh, have electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity. Uh, some uh, have been used, utilized, and observed to have antimicrobial properties. Uh, they have interesting properties uh, as oriented materials and so on. Uh, so a number of these uh, properties can be measured in terms of uh, uh, thermomechanical properties, uh, uh, conductivity, and electrical conductivity. Now let me uh, caution you or uh, take note that when we measure properties of nanocomposites or nanomaterials in general, we have to pay attention to their sample preparation. Uh, the way they are dispersed or compatibilized, and also their orientation. So uh, some of these properties are basically lost in translation, quote unquote, when they are not properly prepared or oriented. So the interesting properties that can be measured are sometimes deceiving in that uh, these are compared to bulk properties, but actually the nanomaterials themselves have some specific orientation to have that advantage. Okay, so here are uh, some more uh, data on um, single wall and multiple carbon nanotubes. 
sometimes they are compatibilized simply by modifying the surface with covalent or non-covalent functionalization. Uh, here we can see the uh, loading on PMMA with request with respect to storage modulus and um, um, frequency uh, in terms of uh, rheological measurements or DMA uh, dynamic mechanical analysis. Here we have the uh, G prime storage modulus as a function of loading. So clearly, the more we load it with the carbon nanotube, the higher the modulus at a certain point. Graphene, graphene oxide, very popular material. A number of ways to prepare them could be in the form of plasma deposition, uh, direct uh, synthesis from metal catalysts. Our favorite uh, low-cost method is in terms of exfoliation of graphite using oxidative uh, techniques such as the Hammers method. So graphene is an interesting material. High young modulus, very effective barrier properties can have conductivity similar to copper. High thermal conductivity, high surface area. Again, these graphene properties are oriented properties. So in other words, in a buff isotropic distribution, these properties may not be true. However, what we like with graphene oxide is we can modify the particle to different chemical functionalities uh, in order to incorporate it as composite materials. And these are some of the properties of the graphene uh, oxide when incorporated uh, with regards to tensile stress and strain. Clearly, higher loading results in more uh, uh, a higher tensile stress property as well as changes in the elongation at break versus tensile strength. So the caveat is the more you um, uh, add um, graphene, uh, you end up reducing the elongation at break properties. La layer silicates include clays, different types of naturals and synthetic clays, including on perlinite, laponite, hectorite. Traditional methods of incorporating them, including milk processing, uh, or different types of compatibilization with organocations. We have done a lot of work on organocation and polymer brush modification. Uh, here it just gives you that a high loading up to 20% weight of clay results in an increase in the tensile modulus. Uh, now as barrier properties, it's very important to orient them simply because in diffusion of gases or molecules, they can be prevented by uh, having a tortuous path orthogonal to the direction of diffusion, as shown here. On the other hand, uh, this can be a poor proposition when it comes to uh, their uh, homogenization in a structure. So polymer clays can be uh, exfoliated and incorporated more homogeneously into a surface and can have corresponding barrier properties as well as retention of dynamic uh, modulus and uh, flexural strength properties. Uh, silica nanoparticles, let me skip that, these two slides, are basically produced uh, perhaps by a number of processes, including Stover processes. Uh, silica particles, which can range from nanometers to microns, uh, they have been used actually for a while uh, in terms of formulations. As particles, they have a high uh, uh, amount of surface area uh, of hydroxyl groups, therefore they have high surface reactivity when it comes to hydroxyl functionality. And thus they've been incorporated in composites and different types of uh, coating formulations, including improving abrasion resistance. So for example, in a high loading of silica particles with a polymer, you have a corresponding increase in the thermal properties, even non-flammability because of the high inorganic content but you end up decreasing some of its uh, thermomechanical properties and processability as well. Now, uh, the last part, we'll probably focus on the elastomeric properties. And again, uh, focusing on one uh, application or segment with the oil and gas industry. Uh, I, we, I've used the term non-metallics uh, for uh, some time uh, in this talk, simply to refer that the oil and gas industry uh, likes to label non-metallics, but in reality, majority of what they label non-metallics are polymers or even rubber. Uh, polymers, of course, 
can either be elastomeric, thermosetting, okay, or thermoplastic. Uh, here you can see some of the parts where one can use elastomers from packers to sealants to hoses, risers, stator, blowout preventers, and so on. And they perform a very important function because not only because of their non corrosivity with uh, high brine conditions. Um, but also because of their uh, chemical resistivity as well as their uh, uh, weight function. So elastomers in general uh, could involve that of a cross-linking between uh, units or, or chains resulting in a uh, um, elongation and uh, elastomeric properties with retention of shape or even shape memory. On the other hand, elastomers can be the form of what we call thermoplastic elastomers, meaning uh, they have hard and soft segments. The hard segments provide crystallinity, the soft segments provide amorphous content. Therefore, you have thermal processability of a thermoplastic, and at the same time, uh, they will end up having the elastomeric properties, but not necessarily the cross-linking uh, property. So uh, several trade names, of course, come into mind, including septon, uh, craton polymers, uh, different types of uh, uh, elastomeric uh, uh, thermoplastic combinations. Now, uh, common examples of elastomeric materials will include your natural rubber, polyurethanes, polybutadiene, neoprene, chloroprene, silicone. Uh, essentially, one can classify them as saturated or unsaturated rubbers. Uh, of course, the history of rubber goes way back when a lot of military applications during World War II required replacement of natural rubber with synthetic rubber. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the oil and gas industry still uses a lot of NBR. Uh, simply because of costs, simply because of uh, a lack of better alternatives uh, for NDR. But in general, one, one uh, has to utilize better rubber formulations uh, when it comes to high-demanding